Perfect. So Sven Rainey will be talking about overcoming free riding in bandit games. I think. Yo, um, thank you very much. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so this is again a paper about uh, bandits, um, somewhat in a very different corner of the bandit theory product space from uh, Nicole's work. I'll come back to that a bit later. Um, it's joint work with uh, Johannes uh, Hörner from Yale and Niklas Klein from uh, Montreal. I don't think either of them is here right now. Johannes is in a plane across the Atlantic and Nicholas's wife is expecting twins, so it might just be happening as we as we speak, actually. Okay, um, so Nicole also al already spoke about the, uh, the key issue when it comes to active learning. It's the well-known trade-off between exploitation and exploration, which is very well uh, captured by the stylized model of the multi-armed bandit, uh, where an agent repeatedly decides which of finitely many arms to pull, and each pull results in a random payoff, and there's uncertainty about the distribution of these payoffs. So as you go on, you earn and learn at the same time, and the, the basic question is how you should do that. Yeah? Um, Nicole already mentioned two, two examples of that, namely experimental consumption, buying uh, products, or, and that's where this literature ultimately comes from, uh, choosing medical treatments. Yeah? If you want to have surveys of problems of this type being looked at in economics, there's a somewhat older one by Dirk Bergemann and Yusuf Alimaki, and a more recent one by Johannes Hörner and uh, Andrzej uh, Skrytmach. Yeah? So if you want two very stylized, simple examples uh, in addition, you could think about a farmer who chooses between a traditional crop and a gene modified one, a new one, or closer to home, uh, each of us, whenever we think about a new research topic, we're essentially choosing to pull a new risky arm. Yeah? Now, um, what my paper relates to is a body of work called strategic experimentation. And there the issue is that you learn not just from the exploration efforts of your own, but also from those of other people. Yeah? So in my two toy examples, you could have farmers with neighboring fields who observe what's going on next door. Or if we pursue a, a research agenda as a team, yeah? as co-authors, we're effectively engaged in strategic experimentation. Yeah, I benefit from what my co-authors are finding out. If they don't make progress, I get discouraged. There are informational externalities going back and forth. Yeah? So it was kind of natural uh, to put the workhorse model of single agent experimentation into this kind of framework of strategic experimentation. So the simplest possible framework of strategic experimentation with bandits would be where you have one safe arm that describes everything that is the outside option, the uh, established crop or the well-known research agenda. The risky arm is risky because its um, reward type is unknown. Yes, so in the simplest model, you have only two such types, good or bad. And let's say that the type of risky arm is identical across all players. So either the genetically modified crop works for all farmers or it doesn't work for any of them. Yeah? And that's unknown initially and needs to be learned over time. Yeah? And then in this first version of this model, uh, we observe that um, all actions and outcome are publicly observable. So this is really a game of a pure informational externality. So whatever some person explores and finds out will be available to others and vice versa. Yeah. Now, this type of game has first been studied by uh, Bolton and Harris in, uh, in the 1990s. They model the type of the risky arm as the high or low drift of a Brownian motion. Yeah. And what they are able to do in continuous time is to characterize the unique symmetric mark of perfect equilibrium. And they identify two effects. Yeah. The first one is the obvious one. Yeah. Uh, we are dealing here with the production of a public good, which is information. Yeah. So of course, in equilibrium, there will be under provision. We will have a free ride problem. Yeah. But they also find a countervailing effect uh, that they call the encouragement effect. 
uh, which means that the presence of other players at least encourages each player to do more than they would be doing on their own. Yeah? So there are two countervailing forces that make this type of equilibrium behavior um, interesting. Then with my uh, authors Martin Cripps and uh, Godfrey Keller, a few years later, we have essentially looked at the same type of setup but we changed the uh, stochastic processes. Yeah? And initially that was motivated by the hope to be able to deal more easily with asymmetric information. It turned out that at that time we didn't really manage to do that, but we realized that because of the simpler stochastics, we could actually uh, dig slightly deeper in the structure of possible Markov perfect equilibrium and that setup. Yeah? So again, we have a unique symmetric MPE like Boltman Harris's, but we could also describe asymmetric equilibria. We could show that there are no equilibria that generalize what you would expect in a single agent setup, namely you experiment up to a certain cutoff and then you drop out. That doesn't exist as an equilibrium in Markov strategies. And one of the messages of our work was that in the confines of Markov perfection, it's actually a good idea to take turns. Yeah? So talking about the core, for example, it's actually a good idea to tell the little group, look, you do now the work, we sit by, you tell us what happens. That's more efficient than if everybody lets the paper uh, die a slow death in their drawers yeah, and reduces the intensity of work over and over again. Yeah? So I'm, I'm sure we've all made that type of experience in the past. Yeah? It is actually more efficient to assign roles as uh, for someone to take the lead for a certain time, and then uh, all this can be made in equilibrium using posterior beliefs as a statement. Yeah. Okay, so that's what um, this particular literature has, has done so far. Now in this paper, we would like to um, do two things. Um, at the first level, we would like to, uh, to make the stochastics richer. So we, we look at so-called Levy bandits that have been used, uh, introduced by Asaf Cohen and Elon Solan a few years back. So Levy processes are just the generalization of both Brownian motion and Poisson bandits. Yes? So these are processes in continuous time that allow for jumps and for uh, diffusion part. So, so this is what we're going to uh, use here to, to build a common roof over the Bolton Harris and the Poisson. But more importantly than that, we actually want to explore non-Markovian behavior. Yeah? We, we want to understand to what extent the findings so far, free riding and encouragement, non-existence of cut of equilibria and the like, are due to the equilibrium concept, mark of perfection, or to what extent they are really uh, outcomes of the underlying uh, economic forces. And the way we do that is a way that's been gone down by many uh, well-known uh, papers before. We're actually discretizing the game. We are uh, letting it, uh, it evolve in continuous time, but players' actions are frozen for a small length of time delta. Then we apply uh, standard perfect Bayesian equilibrium uh, concepts, and we want to characterize the limit of those payoffs as this delta, this discretization length goes to zero. Yeah. And um, we will find a tight upper and lower bound uh, on these uh, limit payoffs, and we will actually construct so-called strongly symmetric equilibria, I'll talk about those in more detail later, that will attain these payoffs as delta goes to zero. And when, when we do that, we will draw on the, on the full um, kind of uh, toolkit that we know from uh, repeated games. Yeah? So we will use the recursive tools from Abru and his co-authors, or in the strongly symmetric case, from Cronshaw and Lundberger. The only difference being that here we are dealing with a stochastic game, you know, not just a repeated game. And um, the main result will be a necessary and sufficient condition for efficiency in the limit. So we will essentially see that under certain circumstances, free riding can be overcome completely. And in those cases where it can't, we will describe precisely well, why and when it cannot. Yeah. 
And uh, here is kind of the, the preview of what I'm going to uh, try to show you. Um, it turns out to matter what kind of payoff process you use. Yeah? Um, that was a big surprise to us uh, when we finally realized it after, after many years, I must say. Um, it really matters whether you have a Brownian payoff component or whether you're just dealing with jumps. Yeah? If you have a Brownian component, like in Bolton and Harris's uh, original model, you get a posterior belief process that is very erratic, yeah, that has unbounded variation. And it turns out that this is enough to make the benefit of carrying out an experiment, that is pulling the risky arm, vanish more slowly as delta goes to zero than the opportunity cost of experimentation. The opportunity cost is just the payoff foregone on the safe arm, and that's scaled up according to the length of the time for which you are doing that. That's linear in delta for small delta. It turns out the benefit of experimentation vanishes like something like delta to the three quarter or even, even some lower bound. Yeah? And this means that for small delta, this benefit of experimentation always dominates. And so you would always want to go till the end, till the efficiency uh, point. Yeah? So when there's Brownian motion to learn from, you always get efficient equilibria in the limit. Yeah? Whereas when the learning is all from Poisson jumps, coming back to uh, the kind of model that I've explored before, then the posterior beliefs are piecewise deterministic. They are much less wild than uh, in the Brownian case. And now the benefit of experimentation also vanishes like delta. Why is that? With Poisson processes, the probability of having at least one good news event coming over the next time interval of length delta is proportional to delta. Yeah? And so this benefit uh, calibrated by the likelihood of getting a, a good news event uh, is proportional to delta and vanishes at the same right rate like the opportunity cost. And so now we have a race between two things going to zero. And in that situation, it can really be the case that you don't get efficiency in the limit, even if people are able to react arbitrarily quickly to deviations. And the point is that efficiency depends on whether you're able to punish a deviating player in the event that good news arrives. That's the only event that will uh, matter, we'll see later. And that is the crucial thing. And we find that efficiency arises if and only if news events are small. So Sven, if, Sven if, can I ask you a clarifying question? You have a very stark distinction between any informative branding component or not. Is there any continuity with the relative size of the branding component, the no, component relative to the no. Poisson? Yeah. Um, no, that, that is not. So an, an epsilon of Brownian motion is enough to get your efficiency. Yeah. And, and this has really to do with, with the fact, these two points here, as soon as you have a little bit of Brownian learning, you get this unbounded variation. Yeah. So an arbitrary small amount of Brownian learning overturns the inefficiency completely. Yeah. Okay, so this is what I want to uh, show you. And so ultimately what we learn in this exercise is that the choice of equilibrium concept matters in that type of model, in that type of game, but the extent to which it matters in turn depends very crucially on the payoff generating process. Yeah. So things turned out very different and in some ways simpler and in other ways more complicated than we would have uh, expected at, at the start. Okay, so that concludes my um, introduction. So if there are no, no other questions about this background, let me talk you briefly through the model. Um, I'll also give you a hint at how the continuous time analysis is done, then we'll discretize the game I'll show you the main theorem and try to make its various elements as clear as I, uh, as I manage, and then we'll uh, wrap up. Okay, so as I told you in the introduction, we're going to look at the simplest possible case of banded experimentation in strategic setup. So we will have one arm that is safe, that's the arm S, and that generates a known flow payoff S greater than zero per unit of time. 
Yeah? So whatever you do in any equilibrium, you can never be pulled below that level because you always have the outside option of just playing it safe and not caring about the world at all. The other arm is risky. Yeah? And it's risky in two ways. Uh, first of all, it yields stochastic payoff increments. And here you have the elements of a very simple Levy process. Yeah? You have a drift term, you have a Brownian motion term, and you have the increments of a jump process. And here we are making our lives um, as simple as possible by just looking at the simplest case of such a jump process. It is a Poisson process. What we're doing can be generalized, but there is not much gain from the added complexity. So let's just think of a Poisson process um, whose increments are scaled up by some factor. Now, where is the riskiness of the yarn? The riskiness at the lower level is really, at the deeper level, is that all these parameters, the alphas, the drift rates, and the arrival rates of the Poisson jumps depend on some unknown state of the world. So n theta is a Poisson process with intensity lambda theta. Now, you see there is no subscript theta at the, um, volatility at the diffusion coefficient here. If there were, because of these erratic movements of Brownian motion, we would be able to figure out the true state instantaneously. So sigma needs to be state independent for this to be an interesting problem. Yeah. And now we're again making this very heroic assumption in this type of uh, Bayesian bandit models that all parameters are known what people are learning about is just this unknown state of the world. Yeah. Okay, um, here is the assumptions we are making. Yeah? If, you, if you think about what you are going to get from playing the risky arm in state R, you will get the drift, yeah. alpha theta per unit of time, and then on average you will get lambda theta jumps per unit of time. Each of those jumps is worth H3. So this n theta is the expected infinitesimal payoff increment from the risky arm. Yeah. So what we assume is that the arm of type zero is the bad arm is strictly worse than the safe arm. And the good risky arm, the arm of type one is strictly better than the safe arm. Yeah. So this assumption one here means it is worthwhile finding out what the true arm is, yeah, what the true type is then we assume that there's always some Brownian noise and we assume that uh, jumps are positive payoffs and we assume that any such jump arrives at least as, frequency, as frequently for a good arm than for a bad arm. And this is a good news assumption. Yeah? Whenever a jump arrives, it makes you typically more optimistic about being in the good state. So how are the earlier models nested within this? If you set the two lambdas equal to each other, then there is no learning from jumps because everything is equally likely under each uh, state. And then you're back in the Bolton-Harris model. If you set the two Brownian drift terms equal to each other, then um, there is no learning about the drift. And then you are back in the Poisson learning model that I explored with uh, Godfrey Keller. And then if you even make the, um, the risky arm fully informative in the sense that the first jump fully settles um, the true type, this happens if a bad risky arm never produces such a jump, then you are back in the 2005 paper uh, that I had with uh, Martin Cripps and, and Godfrey. So this setup nests all those models uh, that uh, I mentioned before. Now, what's the setup? Yeah? Um, we assume that there are n players, each of whom is solving an exact replica of this particular two-arm bandit problem. So they are all facing the same theta, but they have conditionally on that type independent payoff processes. Yeah? So maybe that's a good point uh, to, to focus on the differences between our setup and that uh, studied by Nicole in the previous talk. Yeah? She looked at uh, short-lived agents who exerted an externality across different generations. Yeah? Here we're looking at forward-looking, infinitely lived agents 
in a fixed group who are exerting an informational externality amongst each other at any time. Then her agents were behavioral, ours are fully rational. Her bandits were stochastic, there were no priors involved, ours are Bayesian bandits, players do have priors, uh, they use Bayes' rule to compute what their best estimate of the quality of an arm is. Yeah? And um, Nicole used regret as the payoff criterion. Here we are using, of course, the expected discounted sum of rewards, a classical Bayesian uh, forward-looking payoff criterion. Yeah. And then the other big difference is, of course, um, Nicole was looking at a principle incentivizing agents to do the right thing. Here it's a game between uh, players that are on par with each other. There's no team captain telling them what to do. Yeah. Okay, so talking about priors and beliefs, we assume that everybody has a common prior about how nature chooses the state theta. From then on, all actions and uh, outcomes are observable, so players will always have a common posterior. This posterior belief process can be characterized in full uh, explicit form. We can draw on Cohen and Solan's result for that, so there's a well-defined stochastic process for it. And if we were doing Markov perfect theory, we would use that as the statement. And um, so let's introduce some notation for that. Um, let's call pt the posterior probability at time t that we are in the good state. Yeah? And then conditional on that belief, our best estimate from, of the expected flow payoff from choosing the risky arm is what we call m of pi t, that's the, the convex combination of the two possible uh, current rewards. Yeah? With probability p we get m1, with probability 1 minus p we get m0. So that's the myopic payoff. If I were only choosing arms um, and, and were only to look at the present, I would go for the arm, uh, the, uh, I, I would go for the risky arm if its myopic payoff exceeds S and vice versa. Yeah? And so here is what I mentioned earlier. We are trying to let our players maximize the total expected summed up and discounted payoff and by this normalization, we uh, measure these payoff in papyric units. There's a positive common discount rate. And at each point in time, a player needs to choose whether he chooses k equal to 1, which is the risky arm, then he or she gets m, or k equal to 0, in which case the player gets s. Okay, so that's the setup of, uh, of our game. So let me talk you briefly through the continuous time prehistory of this paper. Yeah? Um, if we do a single agent problem in continuous time of that type, um, this is like a real options problem. Yeah? When to stop exploring the risky option? And um, Godfrey and I and Martin found it very useful to write the uh, hamilton jacobi bellman equation for this dynamic problem, uh, programming problem in the following form. Yeah? This is the value of the problem under the optimal policy. And it can be written as a baseline value, which is S. Yeah? You can always get S plus something extra. Yeah? And this something extra reflects the optimal choice between risky and safe. Yeah? If you play risky, then you get S and the game's over. Yeah? Because if it's optimal to play S now, it must be optimal in the future. So that's it. Yeah? However, if you play uh, risky and k is equal to 1, then you're getting the difference between an informational benefit and an opportunity cost of experimentation. The opportunity cost of experimentation is simply the current reward for one. Yeah? You could have gotten s, instead you're getting m of p. And if p is sufficiently low, you're actually losing money by playing risky. Yeah? So this is the opportunity cost of experimentation. The benefit of experimentation is essentially the effect of the infinitesimal movements of beliefs on your continuation payoffs. And that's captured by 1 over r times the infinitesimal generator of the belief process applied to the value function. So those of you who've ever looked at that kind of model will recognize these terms. The first one reflects Brownian motion learning. Yeah? Brownian learning typically comes with a second derivative. 
And what matters is the signal to noise ratio. Yeah? Alpha one minus alpha zero is the difference in drifts. And that difference is the better visible, the lower is the noise. Yeah? So this first term has to do with Brownian learning. The second term has to do with jump learning as long as there are no jumps. Yeah? So when you are sitting there and there's no jump, then you're thinking, okay, uh, I'm getting more pessimistic. Yeah? My belief is drifting down and it's drifting down the faster, the bigger the gap between the two numbers. Yeah? And that term is captured by this first order uh, term here. And then here is what happens if you get a jump. Yeah, this happens at the expected arrival rate, lambda of p, and if that happens, you believe jumps from p to j of p, so your continuation value jumps from u of p to u of j of p. Of all this, the only thing you need to remember later on are these two things. Yeah? So lambda of p is the expected arrival rate of a Poisson jump, and j of p is the posterior belief once such a jump has arrived. Yeah? So that's the entire, um, if you want, um, Bellman equation and the dynamics, the relevant dynamics of continuation values that we need to, to look at. Yeah? So let's go back to the structure of this hamilton jacobi bellman equation. You see it's linear in K. Yeah? So it is perfectly clear that you either want to do this or you don't, and there will be some optimal cutoff P1 star above which you play risky and below which you play safe. And given all this tractability, one can actually solve this in closed form. And uh, here is a typical big picture that you see from real option theory. Yeah? So the base level is S, the best you can hope for is M1. If you're fully certain of the true state being good, you will get M1. Then you get some convex value function, convexity reflecting the positive value information. And down here, you have some smooth pasting condition which will pin down the optimal uh, cutoff. You know? So that's one agent. Now, as a benchmark for our game, um, let's have a look at N players jointly maximizing the average payoff. They have a similar Bellman equation, but now if K experiments are being carried out, each of them gets the full informational benefit, but each of them only carries an nth of the opportunity cost. You know? So now the trade-off is between B and C over N, but still because of linearity, you either want to go zero or full force. And so you will get another optimal cutoff. The more players there are, the lower will be the cutoff. You will again have a closed form value function. Here's the picture. Yeah? Now, what about Markov perfect equilibrium? And suppose all players except player N use a Markov strategy, then what's the Bellman equation for that player? Again, it has to form a base level. That player gets the benefit of experimentation from all the others for free, and then sim think, uh, simply thinks about her own trade-off, namely, should I experiment or not? And then it's again B minus C. Yeah? I get one more benefit of an experiment, but I also carry the full cost. Yeah? And this makes it clear why efficient behavior cannot be a mark of perfect equilibrium. Um, we have a free value. Okay, so now here is where we come in with the discretization. Um, we now assume that players can adjust their actions only at fixed multiples of some time increment delta. And so if you look at the payoff increment for playing S over that time interval, you get one minus little delta S where delta is just the discount factor corresponding to that discount rate over that time. And similarly, the expected payoff increment from playing risky uh, over that uh, interval is simply one minus little delta times n pi of t, n p of t. Yeah? Now, in that setup, we can define perfect Bayesian equilibrium as usual, and we can define strongly symmetric equilibrium as being a perfect Bayesian equilibrium where no matter what the history is, all, player, all, all players always take the same action. Yeah. So the strong symmetry is meant to allude to the fact that there is not just symmetric behavior on the equilibrium path, but also everywhere. Okay, and so here are the objects that we would like to try and understand. Yeah. For a given discretization length and a given initial belief, we would like to understand 
what are the suprema and infima of average per capita payoffs in perfect Bayesian equilibrium and strongly symmetric yeah. So, Be yeah. before you tell us that, I think uh, Eduardo Fango may, uh, has a question, maybe a clarifying okay. clarify yes, question. I don't know if, yeah. Hi, Sven. I have a very simple question. Uh, do you allow for mixed strategies? So um, we do not allow, for, so let, let's put it that way. Um, our characterization would be robust to that. In our construction, we use um, um, pure strategies with a public randomization. So that's what we actually do. Yeah? But, because the um, mark of, our bounds, mark of our, yeah, our upper and lower bounds for the PBE payoffs allow for mixing. Yeah? So, so that's the correct answer to your question. Yes, uh, we allow for mixed equilibrium when uh, calculating these. Because mi mixing would make the uh, private beliefs potentially diverge from, the, from public there beliefs. Are no private beliefs. So it's very important to, to keep in mind there are no private beliefs. Everything is observable. Yeah? So even if you mix, I can still see what you do in the end. Yeah? And oh, you see the mixture? You, observe, no, you no, would no, observe? But, but I, I see what you do. And, and all my updating is about the bandits, yeah? about oh, right. the, the type that governs. You're right, the you're right, you're right. OK. Yeah. Yeah. OK, yeah. so, so we have these four functions, and they're all in the interval S and M1, yeah? the worst and the, and the best. And they're obviously ranked. Yeah? Um, so let's call W1 delta the single agent value function at discretization level delta. Yeah? Each agent can simply ignore what everybody else does. So that's the, the worst that could happen to you. That's the autarky solution. Yeah? The worst perfect basin equilibrium must be at least as good as that. Um, the, the worst SSE cannot be worse than the worst PBE. The best SSE is better than the worst one, and the best PBE is at least as good as the worst SSE. And everything that players can do in discrete time, they could also do in continuous time. So our continuous time team solution, VN star, is an upper bound. Now, as you let delta go to zero, this lower bound here actually converges to the single agent optimum. Yeah? So that for delta becoming arbitrarily small, all these functions are actually sandwiched in between Vn star and V1 star that we saw on this earlier diagram. Yeah? So the question now is where exactly are those limit functions lying? And here is the answer. So it turns out that um, in the limit, there is a cutoff belief p hat up to which we can get some experimentation. Yeah? And it turns out that it doesn't matter whether we look at perfect Bayesian equilibrium or strongly symmetric equilibrium, as long as we're only concerned with the average payoff per player, or if you want the sum of the players' payoffs. Yeah? So if we are doing a utilitarian, equally weighted welfare criterion, then PBE and SSE are exactly equally good. Yeah? And so we get this p hat, and the limit of the best equilibrium is one where all players use the risky arm down to some level p hat, and then switch to the safe arm forever. So that's the first part of the theorem. Now, what is this p hat? If alpha one is equal to alpha zero, so if the Brownian motion component is informative, then p hat equals the efficient cutoff in continuous time. And hence that limit payoff function, everybody working down to that level is indeed the efficient payoff in continuous time. So full efficiency as soon as there is some um, Brownian learning. If there's no Brownian learning, then things are more complicated. Then this belief p hat depends in a particular way on the fine details of this race between two effects that go to zero at rate, rate delta. I'll put up this equation uh, in more detail later on, so let's not dwell on it at the moment. And using that equation, we can even say under what circumstances you will get full efficiency and under what circumstances you might get no improvement over the range of experimentation in a single agent situation at the other extreme. Yeah. So that's what we show in the paper. Um, let me revisit these three bits uh, 
piece by piece. So as uh, soon as we have just, about... just to remind you that I will have to wrap up in five minutes. Okay, I will do that. Yeah. So um, asymptotic efficiency arises as soon as you have a Brownian component. Yeah. What's the intuition for that? The fact is that if your experimentation in the limit were not efficient, you would have to end with a cutoff that is to the right of PN star. In that case, the function that arises in the limit would have a convex kink at that cutoff. But in such a situation, the diffusion part of posterior beliefs would induce an incentive to experiment be beyond that point. And the reason is that due to the very erratic movements of beliefs back and forth across the cutoff, you, you find that the informational benefit vanishes at a rate slower than delta to the three quarters, whereas the opportunity quest cost vanishes like delta. So for small deltas, you really want to carry on beyond that p hat until the kink is away. But the kink being away just means smooth pasting means efficiency. So those of you who are familiar uh, with the reasoning to justify smooth pasting and stopping problems, for example, from Dixit and Pindyke's book, will recognize that kind of logic. Yeah? So it's the an unbounded variation of posterior beliefs that rules out kinks that forces us into efficiency. Now, if we have poor Poisson learning, then um, we have this, this fact that it might depend on the fine details of the situation. So here the intuition is informational benefit and opportunity cost of experimentation both vanish like delta. And this equation here essentially equalizes the rates at which they vanish at this cutoff belief p hat. And what matters is the ability to punish a deviator in the event that good news arrives. So how can you see that in this uh, thing here? Yeah? So let's first look at the right hand side. This is the opportunity cost of experiment. Yeah? So suppose everybody else is carrying out the right thing and you are thinking about whether you deviate or not. If you conform to the experiment, then with the arrival rate n times lambda, good news will arrive and then you will get the continuation payoff v and p hat evaluated at the posterior belief. Yeah? And your payoff improves from s, if nothing happens, to that good payoff. If you deviate, there are only n minus one chances to have a good event, namely all the others are doing the work, you're sitting by. You might still get a payoff improvement, but now because of the punishment that will come, you will be pushed down to the worst possible equilibrium, and so you will get V1 star. Yeah? So what matters now is how harsh that punishment here can be. Yeah? And our result here is that you can get asymptotic efficiency if news are small. Yeah? So you can get P hat equal to P and star, the efficient cutoff, if starting at that cutoff, a success brings you below the single agent cutoff, because then your continuation payoff in the worst possible equilibrium would still be S. So if we compare that indifference condition with the one for the social planner, the social planner says, I want N experiments and I'm doing that until these N experiments cover the costs of one yeah, because of the full informational spillover. You can transform one equation in the other if the second term here is equal to zero. But that's precisely the case if V1 star of the posterior belief equals S. Yeah. And the intuition here is that if a deviating player can be held down to S even after good news, then that player effectively lives in a world where she sets the benefit of n experiments against the costs of one. And that's precisely the trade-off that the social plan affects. Yeah. Vice versa, if you have big news, if after deviation a success brings you up to, into a range where you get more than s as a punished player, then um, a deviating player does better than S, and so that player sets the benefit of N experiments against more than the costs of one, and hence drops out more early, earlier. Yeah? 
And in the extreme case, if you have fully conclusive news, the J term fully jumps up to one, and then everybody's so happy you can't carry out any punishment at all. Yeah? And in that situation, actually, you can show that the best possible equilibrium doesn't improve over and above the single agent cutoff, except for the fact that at least everybody experiments full speed up to down there, yeah? down there, but you can't get beyond that point. Yeah. So here is a case of poor, poor Poisson learning where you get some uh, numerical illustration. Yeah? So the dotted line is the single agent payoff. The solid line is the efficient payoff. And here is what you get in the best possible uh, perfect Bayesian or strongly symmetric equilibrium um, in the limit. Yes, yeah? So we're doing better of course, better than single agent. If I drew in the symmetric Markov perfect equilibrium in continuous time, it would also be fairly close to V1 star, so we're doing better than that. But in general, with Poisson learning, you might have uh, inefficiency. Yeah. Okay, so it's time for me to, to get to the, uh, to the end. So let me briefly uh, mention, we can fully characterize the range of combinations of lambdas for which you get efficiency or uh, inefficiency. Um, we, we construct these equilibria by constructing strongly symmetric equilibria that have a two-state automaton with the public randomization strategy. The idea is that you have a good state in which you play a cutoff strategy with a fairly low cutoff, and you have a bad state in which you play a cutoff strategy with a fairly high cutoff. Yeah? So you use the cutoff that is low to, to generate the good payoffs, and you use the cutoff that is high to punish everyone. Yeah? And then um, you have a normal state. If everybody does the good thing, you stay there. If someone deviates, you punish by going to the uh, punishment state. In the punishment state, you play the bad cutoff strategy with a very demanding cutoff. If everybody carries out the punishment, you go back to the good state with a certain probability, otherwise you stay there. And these things can be calibrated in a way such that uh, it's possible to verify that these things are uh, enforceable, self-enforcing. Um, let me not go into techniques here. And, and so we get these strongly symmetric equilibria and then by letting delta go to zero and adjusting the cutoff strategies, we can show that we can get arbitrarily close to the N star and V1 star in the Browning case and to VNP hat in the poor Poisson case. Okay, so um, let me conclude. What we're doing here is good news Levy bandits. So we are working in continuous time and news comes both gradually and in lumps. Yeah? And we discretize our experimentation game. We freeze actions for delta units of time. We characterize the range of experimentation and equilibrium payoffs as delta vanishes. The construction uses this two-state automata. And if you look at the paper, you will see that we rely very, very much on the closed form solutions that we know from continuous time. So all the work is done essentially at the limit. So we're, we're always exploiting the tractability of the continuous time limit to say something about discrete time away from the limit. Yeah, in discrete time, all these payoff functions are fixed points of some Bellman type operators, very hard to, to get a handle on, but close to delta equal to zero, there's enough structure for us to be able to, to do what we do. Yeah? Asymptotic efficiency arises whenever there's Brownian learning, especially in the original Bolton Harris framework. Otherwise, it depends on how large these Poisson news events are. Um, in the paper, we do some comparative statics of this cutoff. Um, we also briefly discuss uh, other payoff generating processes. There is no harm to making these lump sum payoffs informative with respect to their size. That doesn't really change anything. If we were thinking about bad news drums, then technically it would require a completely different analysis because in the breakdown version of this kind of model, we don't have the closed form solutions anymore. So while we believe that the economics is precisely the same as we have, the technique would have to be different. So we are not doing this um, 
at the moment. Uh, we're also presenting some functional equations for the best and worst payoffs in discrete and continuous time, which might be useful in other applications. And currently we're thinking about how to use the fact that we have V1 star as the worst possible asymptotic equilibrium payoff, how to leverage that in constructing asymmetric equilibria that maximize different welfare criteria. So what's the best equilibrium in a three-player game for, for player models? But this is very Thanks. speculative at the moment and will not uh, have that um, very soon. Yeah? So and we also run I out think, of time, Sven. Exactly. I'm sorry. I, think, I, said, I, <laughs> I have to get you there. Thanks a lot. Yes. Um, so formally, we run out of time. Um, I think your concluding slides may have covered uh, some questions already. Anyway, I had a question that you covered already. So, uh, but I do invite people if Ben is willing to stay around uh, during um, the break. Uh, if people have questions, you are welcome to stay and ask questions. Uh, so thanks, uh, thanks a lot to our two speakers for wonderful talks. And uh, we have a break now, and as I announced earlier today, unfortunately, uh, John Tirol had to uh, cancel uh, his plenary address that was scheduled at 11.15. Uh, so he was looking forward to his talk and he regrets um, having to cancel it. Uh, so um, we are going to keep the rest of the schedule unchanged. So we are going to have a longer break together with our lunch break, and we are going to be back at 12.45 uh, Eastern time. With the uh, afternoon sessions, we have Najib Ali, Rachel Cranton, Julia Erasman, and Lorna Smith in the afternoon. So thanks very much uh, to everyone. Thank you, Stan and Nicole. Marina, thanks can I just add that, yeah. Thanks. Yes, Marine. Yeah, can I just add that uh, Jean Tirole's slides are available on the conference website if anyone wants to have a look at those. Good, thanks. I have a question. Hi, Sven. You um well thank you for a very nice talk um you obviously make uh heavy use of the perfect monitoring uh assumption in your sort of bang bang two-state automaton construction some of your examples uh so some of your motivation uh especially the teamwork uh example suggests that moral hazard could be a very you know, interesting thing to consider in these games. Uh, so I'm wondering if, if you guys have thought about the case where uh, rewards are observable, but not, but not actions. Obviously, this brings the issue of private beliefs, which enormous, exactly. enormously complicates uh, the analysis. But. Yeah, so um, I think that's, that's a very natural thing to do, yeah? And, um, I think it would be very interesting, for example, to look at uh, a version of uh, Bolton and Harris, where uh, I, ca I can only see what, what, what the rewards are, and I, I don't really know what the actions are. Uh, so, so that would be a brown emotion version of uh, Bonatti and Herner, uh, Herner's uh, Poisson version. Yeah? And, and then I would think that techniques like what you're doing with, with Yuli, or what Yuli has done before, yeah? uh, that would be very, very much uh, at the right, right place there. Yeah? The, the difference being that here we have a stochastic game with a very peculiar kind of uh, stochastic process of beliefs. Yeah? Um, so we have, we have started to think about this at the level of, yes, it would be nice to do that, but uh, we haven't made any, any progress. So, but I, I think it would be really natural to to look at that. You're perfectly right. Yeah. Um. Sven, so I had a question. So I guess, you know, so the way you're choosing, of course, a particular way of discretizing the game in order yeah. to, to take the limit. Um, and so I was curious whether you have any comments about other possible discretizations and whether those would affect the conclusions. So um, I have no, no general results, yeah? and, and we do acknowledge in the paper that in principle other discretizations could lead to other limit results. Yeah? We have looked into things like uh, Poisson clocks, allowing all players to update their actions at some exponential time. As far as we can say, that won't change anything. Yeah? We do not know what happens if these Poisson clocks are asynchronous. Yeah? So what would happen if various players can adjust uh, in stochastically alternating fashions? So the, the, the true answer is uh, 
we think that in one particular case, um, this is robust, but we don't really know what happens in the other scenarios. Sven, I'm still struck by the discontinuity between the Brownian motion and the Poisson. Um, so, and, and your, what, do you have a sense of what happens to the equilibrium payoffs as the difference between the alphas goes to zero? Do we get a convergence in at least equilibrium payoffs, even if we don't get convergence in the specification of the strategies? Yes, I would, I would think so. Yeah. So, okay. so the, the payoffs will, will, uh, um, okay. Yeah. But it's, hmm. Hmm. No, I, I, no, this, this can't be right. Yeah, it can't be right. Because suppose we are in a situation where the lambdas per se lead to inefficiency. Yeah? And then we're slowly switching off the sigma or, or we're slowly switching off the, the um, alpha zero minus alpha one. And then it, it, it must also be discontinuous in the payoffs. I see. So it, 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 there, there cannot be continuity. Yeah? This is I, I find that pretty mind boggling. Yeah? But yeah, it, it's I mean, like disturbing. The, some people might say. Yes. Yeah. And 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 it is as if this world where where there's a, a, a Brownian component is really a very different one from the one where, yeah. where the drugs are. Yeah. It, it it's like uh, two different universes in. Um, my, my intuition was always that uh, when I started this uh, this combination, that uh, no matter what the sigmas are, it, there should still be this intuition that large jumps would destroy efficiency. Yeah? I, I, I was very firm in my belief that that was come out, would come out, and it simply doesn't. Yeah, this this brown emotion swamps everything else. And, um, yeah. It, it, it is disturbing in a way, yeah? it, because it, when, when people write down models and say, let's model this as a Brownian motion, or let's model it as a Poisson process, the economics are the same. Um, that's simply not true. Yeah? And, and that, that is really weird. Very nice. So Sven, sorry, I think you said this already, but now I'm thinking about it again. What does it say about discrete time models? Because there I would always have the chance. Um. Um, so I understand your main result is, is a limit result, right? And, and you know, as, as Naveen was saying, we can discuss whether it depends on how we take the limit. But if I'm thinking of discrete time models, what do I, what do I learn from this? Okay, so, so for example, in uh, our, um, the construction of equilibria that we, that we do would say that in this fixed increment discretization, uh, if delta is uh, sufficiently small, you will find a cut of strategy in one state, a cut of strategy in the other state, such that players playing these things and switching between states as we described is a perfect Bayesian equilibrium that discrete time can. Yeah? So, so what you would learn is that in discrete time, um, you can have uh, strategies that are of the cutoff type in uh, on, on path at least, yeah? and uh, so you, you can characterize what the what the leaf processes are. So they will be smoothed out by, by the brown motion part, and their means will be shifted according to how many jumps you observe. So this can all be, be described fair, uh, fairly. No, no, but picking up on Marina's question, the question would be, if we, let's suppose we have a discrete model and then we want to know, when do we get efficiency in the discrete time model? And now I think what your answer is going to be that there's going to be a very delicate trade-off between the size of the discretization right. and how important we think the continuous component of learning is. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So by, by uh, choosing this um, Levy process, I have implicitly already taken a stand on how, how these two, uh, components are, are weighted. Yeah? So the information content grows linearly in time, both on the Poisson side and on the uh, Brownian motion side. Yeah? In a discrete time model, you could reweight these things pretty much arbitrarily. Yeah? Um, and um, so it, it, I think it will depend a lot on the specifics of the situation, what you're really, mm. what you're really modeling. Yeah? I see. I see. Thanks. <laughs>